This is David Rawlings. He is a master of swordsmanship and weapon arts with over 25 years experience and is the founder of the London Longsword Academy. Today he's looking at some of the weapons and fighting styles from From Software's newest epic, Elden Ring. If you use a hammer like this, I'd suggest that you're probably not going to have an intact back to make it up the stairs. I highly recommend checking out the London Longsword Academy. All their links and information will be in the description. But without further ado, let's see what a swordmaster makes of Elden Ring. So, the broadsword. And here we have a little bit of heresy. If you notice the grip in there, it's quite long. So this is what I would call an arming sword. And sometimes it gets a broad, called a broadsword, but sometimes a long sword or a sword in two hands also gets called broadsword. So it's a little bit of a throwaway term that doesn't really mean very much. So for me, if I'm fencing, if I'm holding a sword in one hand and its main utility is one hand, really it's going to be a sword in one hand. That's as simple as it goes. And that could be a rapier, could be a doosack, it could be, as I say, an army sword. If the sword has enough room for me to put two hands on it, now I can use this like a long sword. And because of having the sword in my two hands, my body structure has to change slightly to adapt to it. So effectively, I would use the techniques that I would use with longsword. And then really what we have is a debate between the difference of length of my blade and that of my opponent. So it's a little bit of a broad subject for a badly named sword. So broadsword in the game, a little bit of a throwaway term. You can use these things in two hands, and that's really what we would call a longsword. You can hold in one hand, it would be an arming sword, or depending on the blade type, potentially a rapier or potentially a side sword. And usually with those things, we're really discussing the hilt more than we are the blade. Okay, one thing that I will draw attention to is there's, um, if you if you like me and you play Elden Ring, you might have these points where you're kind of like, you huddle behind your shield and then you do an attack. Now, I want you to think kind of how illogical this is. If you're doing a block and then you get to do an attack, that means your opponent can either carry on attacking by just going, well, you've blocked, now I'm gonna do another attack or they have time to react again in some other form. So really you will very often actually take the blow on the sword or deflect with the sword rather than using the shield. So these sort of like hide behind the shield, dum, 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 do something, eh, not, not the best use to be honest. Nice little slips, rearranging a space, take the blow and attack at the same time, take the blow, quite often cut the leg because people will naturally cover their face, which will expose the leg. This sort of thing is more the sort of thing you wanna see in sword and shield combat. One thing that Elden Ring does get really, really historically accurate is the art of sneaking up to someone while wearing full plate or full chain and just shanking them from behind because you can't fault that, genuinely. Whenever I see the Dark Souls drawing of the sword, the Eido style move and the leaping forwards, for some reason, I think that Dead Cells has got it so much better than Elden Ring. It's really, really cool. It's just this nip across the screen and you just take out everything in sight. So one of the things I really like about the uh, the animation of the Japanese swords is that there's this very, very often this very good commitment to the strike, that there is an intention to strike and cut and cleave all the way through. And this is something that you should have with European swords as well. There is this idea that you're really cutting your opponent as if they're not there. And this forces them to go on the defensive because then they have to deal with something which is fully intentioned. Now, obviously, in dealing that blow that you intend to take all the way to the floor, if necessary, and still remain balanced, which is one of the things I like about the way they show the Japanese swordsmanship, you do your big cleaving cut, but you're behind the sword, you settle in a comfortable position that you can then move on from. So if we were doing this in Lichten Hour tradition, what we would try and do is make sure that our opponent has to focus their energy on defending themselves, which means that they can't re-attack. And then while they're doing that at the same time, we mutate our attack into another attack or we continue that same attack. Although one thing does have to be pointed out, the use of edged weapons against armor, particularly full encasing armor, is is not good that's kind of what is designed to stop so the idea that you go riding past people are all, oh well look that metal that you're wearing doesn't seem to have any um, substantial qualities that's something that could be addressed so the uh, the flail of unreasonable ball size this is this is an interesting thing. You really, really would not want to swing such enormous balls. Having such pendulous balls would be an absolute problem in real life. They're really going to be nothing more than a hindrance. How can you actually 
move and recover. And recovery is a really, really important thing when you're on foot and you're fighting, because if you miss, so much of fencing comes down to what happens if it goes wrong. So having such large and pendulous balls is really, really not a good idea on a weapon. Now here we have a historical plow, something that you would use. And this is actually used very, very, very similar to one of these swords that you can probably see behind me. These are montantes. So all of the things that you do are gonna be about controlling the space between you and your opponent, cutting at them, being able to recover, being able to thrust, being able to move around any potential defense that they make and being able to recover again to defend any potential attack or re-attack that they make. Now, obviously when you're using a flail, there's a lot more need to keep the momentum going. So you're really, you're keeping going, you're keeping going. And as soon as anything goes wrong, you need to then find another way to get the whole thing moving again, because as soon as obviously the inertia has gone out of the balls, then you have a bit of an issue. So certainly the flail exists as a historical weapon, but big pendulous balls on your flail, not good. Something usable that you can recover with. But the only th other thing I'd say about the flail is obviously if you have something that has a haft and it has a chain on it and it has something you swing, again, very, very similar to what I was saying before about the Dusak, this can still be trained it with in a one-handed manner. There's no reason that you couldn't use it is whether it's the best tool for you to use. There are better tools. So yes, certainly you could use it as an improvised weapon. Certainly you could flail with it. It's going to be able to get around shields. It's going to be able to do this kind of thing. You could certainly use it one-handed. You could certainly use it two-handed. It's whether it is the best tool for you to do so properly. So the Chotel. Um, I don't know very much about the Chotel, and up until last week, I had never actually handled one. What I would say is, I don't want to comment on the use of this, and I would suggest that you get hold of Damon Stith and ask him, because he's an absolute expert in African martial arts. And I'd really, really like to see his take on this. What we're seeing, which is consistent with the, uh, the benefits of the weapon, is uh, these descending strikes. So from what we know about Chotel fighting, that it was very favorable from these high high guard positions coming down, striking over and around the shield. You know, even if you were to like parry it with another sword or another weapon, uh, the blade would 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 uh, s still manage to get around that weapon. So I'm glad to see those descending blows, which would have been very common uh, for that weapon. One thing that that's typically you know in conjunction with the Chotel is going to be the uh, the Gashan the shield, which helps to uh, eliminate some of the defensive issues with the weapon and stuff. Very strong sweeping blows. Uh, the Chotel is, is, are typically double-edged, but the examples that I've seen are typically sharp on both sides. And so there is a uh, precedence for using the sword in both configurations. The grip is rounded, so it allows you to index the blade to be used either as a, a extremely curved shamshir style sword or like the sickle. So um, it's good to see that. It looks like a couple of times he's, he rotates the blade to use the convex edge of the Chotel and then rotates it back. So that's a really good um, nod to both sides being functional and the ability to be able to switch between the two. All right, so now he's fighting a guy with the shield and this is interesting. The awkwardness of this, the weirdness of the design is meant to get around shields. This is one of the one of the theories of this. It, it would be nice to see some of that action. I mean, it's probably difficult to kind of portray that, you know, on the game, but it would be a really cool um, addition to this character to be able to have movements that would allow him to get around the shield, even to like hook, hook and pull shields down um, with that weapon. <laughs> what did he stab him with? How did he stab him with the show tail like that? <laughs> Ah, rapiers. The idea that a rapier is entirely to thrust is ludicrous and ill-informed. Very often, people really look at rapiers and what they're doing is they're looking at the hilt. It must have an ornate hilt of some kind, so therefore it's a rapier. And they don't look at the capacity of the blade. So certain blades are made for cutting, certain blades are made for thrusting. And really, you should be looking at the capacity of each sword to do both. 
So really, quite often, if we're dealing with, if you want to look at something as being a, a rapier as being a robe sword, again, one of these arming swords I show you, well, that's as robe as you can get. You hang around in your monkey robes and we have a manual where people are fighting with these things. That's a cut and thrust weapon. How good a cut comes down to the quality and the purpose of the weapon that you build. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you a couple of small swords because these are even more considered to be thrusting weapons, but the same choices are being made. So here is a small sword, and you could do exactly the same thing with the rapier, as I said, which is really just designed for thrusting. But that's because somebody has made the blade in that particular style. And I'm going to show you another small sword. This is not a spadroon, it's a small sword, but it is absolutely sharp on both sides. And you could cleave with this because it has weight and it is designed to cut. And then it has a nice, slightly bold tip for the stabbing of you. So what's happened is people have got a budget and they choose what to do with that budget. I want it primarily to thrust because that's how I think my advantage in fighting lies. Or I want it to be able to cut and thrust because that's where my advantage in fencing lies. So the idea that a rapier, rapier is a thrusting weapon is completely, completely freaking wrong. It is a cut and thrust weapon depending on the quality of the blade. You don't have an edge on it, you can't cut with it in the same way as if you don't have a point with it, you can't thrust with it, simple as that. However, this rapier is not a rapier, it's kind of a sword in two hands, which goes back to my original point. That if it's in two hands, it's kind of like it's a long sword. So it's being used as a long sword would be if you were primarily just work working on hanging points, which are just thrusty, 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 thrust, wind, wind, wind. It's not really very rapier. Um, the fittings are kind of fantasy longsword, but again, I say fantasy with a little bit of tongue in cheek because historically we have made some incredibly florid designs on our hilts. So fantasy is just our willingness to buy gaudy things, unfortunately. So no, it's not a good representation of either the argument of what a rapier is, nor necessarily of the form of a rapier. So as far as move sets for the rapier is concerned when it's held in one hand, I don't dislike it. It's very, very simple. You start off with the point facing the opponent and you bring the point to them fairly directly. And that will be either done with your point hanging down or your point hanging up or your point hanging down from this side. So it's actually a pretty good set of movements, but I would say it's not necessarily restricted to those of a rapier, whatever a rapier is. Oh, the incredibly bad use of the of the two-handed, <laughs> the great sword, or the spy hander, or the beaden hander, or the spadone. So obviously, I have some very very large swords, and I can use them all like a long sword because I practice with them. And there's information in the treaties that kind of suggests that you should be. Now, those things will be little hints like it's a sword, so therefore we should use it like swords. So. I would, however, say that swinging around one-handed is, again, not your best use of something which has got an awful lot of mass. Use the two hands on the two-handed swords. And the truth of the matter is, is if you're holding it in two hands, unless the thing is completely, completely rid of balance, you can use in a very, very similar way. You know, there's this point where you're just going like, hold down the Y button, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> Put it in two hands. It's meant to be held in two hands. It's what the button's there for. Now, dual welding, two freaking big swords, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm completely against the holding of one two-handed sword in one hand. But when you've got two two-handed swords in two hands, then I think they probably just balance out. Two things I've really enjoyed in Elden Ring are riding, 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 riding more. And those are all parts A, B, C, D, E of point one, I'd like to point out, because riding is subsets of the joy of riding. And then part two is creeping up on people using an increasingly unlikely set of noisy things that I can wear and wave around and stealth them. Great. Aha, so the ridiculously big hammer for all of those fans of Strontium Dog. So if you use a hammer like this, I'd suggest that you're probably not going to have an intact back to make it up the stairs. So you certainly have weapons which have got a lot of mass where there's actually genuinely advice of hit them with this really big hammer on a stick. Make sure you don't miss. 
and the reason being is because you're probably going to get one go to do this and then what you're going to do um it's a little bit too heavy to use i would suggest that the really really big hammer unless you have balloons supporting it to counteract some of the weight is a bad choice in real life as far as i'm aware you can get turtle turtle shields so i'm obviously this is not something you should be doing you can get perfectly fine synthetic shields that you don't need and you can get metal um, you also get things like rhino skin shields and things like this, and you get leather shields. So the idea of using animal product to make something defensive is, is not outside the realms of possibility at all. The things that I really love about Elden Ring is obviously exploring the world is absolutely incredible. I spend ages, like I say, just riding and riding and riding, and I don't fight nearly as much as potentially I'm supposed to. So I really love that aspect. I love how much attention to detail there is on so many of the weapons. And I kind of wish that some of them had a little bit more access to historical replicas or historical pieces rather. I don't mind there being fantasy weapons. I really enjoy that. I also want to have the overpower thing. And frankly, I spend most of my time being a wizard because it's easier. My name is David Rawlings and I run the London Longsword Academy and despite the name we actually deal with an awful lot of different systems of fencing and different types of weaponry, all kinds of things. We're very, very accessible, we are very LBGT friendly, we have a excellent, excellent community and some very, very good new instructors coming through the works. I've been teaching this for 20 odd years so i really really know my business very very well we have a very very long established school in london you can find us online as well and we are absolutely bloody amazing if you'd like to see more of david as well as other martial and medieval style episodes make sure to like the video and let us know in the comments and i hope you'll join me in thanking david the london longsword academy and damon stith for collaborating with us on this video you can check out some of their videos as well as their other information in the description below thanks for watching